Are we still good, everybody? Yeah. All right. So um, this, so this is the part where I'm going to shine a little sun on what we just talked about this morning, okay? And so we're back in Ephesians 3, and then we're going to get into some very practical stuff here. So this is why all of this is very important. If you think about it, um, if the current model that we use is we're just going to keep the doors open and hope they come, has that been a very successful model? And that, that's a rhetorical question. Has that been a very, so then what, what model should we do and why should we do it? What, what, el what else is going to work other than Jesus' message and his method? That's why he gave it to us. And so um, Paul continues in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. He says this, For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. Is that not beautiful? I'm sorry. Just every name is from our almighty God. That according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded, this is the ESV version, I, I titled this with the NIV version because I think rooted and established sounds awesome. Rooted and grounded is the same thing. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints... To comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. God bless the reading of his word. So I'm going to pull out just some, uh, all of those clauses to me are beautiful, but I'm going to pull out some ones that kind of illustrate what it is that we're talking about. Um, did you notice what it says that they are rooted and grounded in? What are they rooted and grounded in? Love. love. Rooted and grounded in love. Love is the nutrients that makes our root system strong. Love for God, love for others. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say this, um, and so you got to hear me out because what I'm going to say sounds controversial until I explain it. Uh, oftentimes we use phrases like a personal relationship, with, it's my personal relationship with God. Yes, God knows us each personally and has a relationship with us. But is there anything that's really just supposed to be between you and God, the way he's designed it? Something to think about, right? I would say that um, the whole idea of having a personal relationship with God has been very damaging because I have actually heard Christians say to me, hey, that's between me and God. Mm. That, that's not how it works in, in the church, Okay. So that you being rooted and grounded in love. Love is the nutrients, love for God, love for each other. Now I want, I want to point out this clause here. So that you may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. So us being rooted and grounded with each other, actually, are, are you hearing what I'm hearing? It's, that is actually what gives us the strength to be able to comprehend the love, the height, the depth, the length. The, are y'all hearing that? And who is it that we, that we root with? With all the what? Who is that? The church. I, mean, I just think that's, I'm, I'm standing up here going, I don't even know what to say about that. I think it's unbelievably beautiful. That we cannot, without the other saints, comprehend the love of Jesus like it's almost like God gave us the church so that we can be locked in together so we can actually experience his love so we can actually comprehend it I hope the churches here in Canada are doing that I hope that they are experiencing the love of Christ in your congregations I hope that because by the way it's tough out there I keep saying it right it's tough out there Jesus said it was and that when you come into your church you are rooted and grounded and you go oh there it is I'm home uh, the embassy of heaven where I'm rooted and grounded and I feel the length, the breadth, the height, the depth of Christ's love for me. Amen and amen, right? Um, and so uh, I, I've got a little illustration here with this. Um, has anybody been to the States to visit the Redwoods? 
The Redwood Forest? Okay. I've got one guy that lives in the States, okay. <laughs> Who's also from South Africa. And so, <laughs> um, so anyway, the Redwoods are amazing. They're like 350 feet tall, the tallest one. Like that's, that's, that's a football field and a little bit more, right? They're tall. Unbelievably tall. Um, and so as tall... Oh, there, so there we go. Thank you. You are helping me out tremendously. We are making a connection here, you and me, that's helping me connect with all of this. Hey, so here it is, everybody. A redwood tree, sequoia tree, is um, the size of a Canadian football field. That's how tall it is. And as tall as that, I mean, it has like, I can't even tell you how many hundreds of gallons of water it has going through it. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. But the interesting thing about it is it's 350 feet tall, 300 to 350 feet tall, except that, see, I'm saying feet, and y'all are like, y'all know what feet are, right? Okay. Because I, I, I don't know. If I had to live off the metric system, I'd just be lost all the time. Um, but as tall as that is, their root system, interestingly enough, only goes down about 12 feet. It's kind of the secret of the redwood tree. So how on earth is a tree that tall um, able to withstand itself when its root system is only 12 feet deep? And interestingly enough, because uh, most trees, the root system goes down as, as, uh, goes down as far as it is tall, right? Well, it only goes 12 feet, and the roots are only about this big around. So what happens is the secret of the redwood tree is they don't grow alone. They never grow alone. You will not never see a redwood tree standing by itself. And what happens is the roots go out, and they interlock with the others, rooted and established. And they can face the gale force winds that come from the west, uh, that come off the ocean and try to blow them down, and they hold each other up. And that's what the church is supposed to be. And us being rooted and grounded in Jesus' love, that's why the, I, I titled this whole talk, that if we do that with each other, and we are able to comprehend the love of Christ and feel the fullness, which I'm going to talk about here in a second, then we, we have no other choice but to take that out into the world because I have never met anybody on the other side of that wall that doesn't want hope. Hey, would you like to have some hope? Nah, I'm good. <laughs> like Nobody, everybody wants hope. Everybody's looking for it. That's one thing that we all have in common because we know that, uh, that God has set eternity in our hearts. So the Redwood Secret, how, how many of that's like a learning thing for you? That, like, that, that illustrates what the church should be for me. And when I talk about rooted and established, that's why we have uh, that as our background. Uh, so I hope you all can take that with you now. And remember that that's what the church is supposed to be. Redwoods don't grow alone. Redwoods hold each other up. So let's be redwoods, right? So to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So we miss out on the extent of our relationship with Christ if we just want to know more about him without being transformed by him where the world sees something different in us. Transformation only happens in the context of relationship. And I could, if y'all ever want to read an interesting read, it's called The Other Half of Church. It's a, it's a fascinating book and I read it and I was like, man, I've heard all this before. And it turns out the guy that wrote it was a guy that I went to Africa with and did the men's work. It's cra like another one of those, whoop, right? God keeps doing that. Uh, it's a brain science book where he talks about, because he, he's a very intellectual man, but he's talking about like, hey, you know what? If I was the designer of the universe, I would design humans like this so the church would work. And one of the things, um, so it, it kind of talks about why the church works with how we are designed and why God would have done it that way. And one of the things that he talks about is um, the, uh, the group identity that comes through being a Christian and being locked in with each other. Um, Christianity is a very group identity-based um, thing that we do. Y'all know that, right? Like, how many times do you hear Paul say, like, say things like, you used to be, bong, 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 but now you are, therefore you, like, we don't do that, guys. Hey, that thing y'all used to do, we don't do that. It's a group identity. And uh, 
about every, in, in the brain science of that, every six of a second, we think about what do my people do. So if you want to explain the unexplained mysteries of your life, um, when you do something and you go, why did I just do that? There's a very good chance that, like, maybe your parents did it that way. You, you know what I mean? Like, oh my, or how, how many times have you done that thing where you did something, you swore you were never going to be like your dad or your mom, and then you do it, and then you go, what just happened? Uh, because it turns out even more, and I, I got to phrase this, when it comes to transformation, if you want to transform, hang out with the right people, and you start becoming like them, which is different than just sitting around reading scripture all the time. You need both, but do you see the difference? Um, so it surpasses knowledge, and, and Jesus actually kind of illustrates this point in John chapter 5, verses 39 through 40, he says this, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me. So a dangerous thing that we need not do is search the scriptures so that we don't actually ever have to come in contact with them. And so we don't ever have to come in contact with others. So our relationship with Christ and his church is where we experience the fullness of God, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. May our churches here in Canada, may our churches in the United States, may our churches in North America be a place where people can experience the fullness of God. But I got to say this about the fullness of God. In order for us to experience the fullness of God, it requires to empty ourselves completely. And that's usually the hang up. So I, I want to, so if I uh, empty myself 90%, and fill it with 90% of the, God, of, of the Almighty and, and his people, am I experiencing the fullness of God if I still keep 10% of myself? No, because you've still got 10% of yourself. We have to empty ourselves completely. And in order to do these things that we're going to talk about in discipleship, uh, we have to let go uh, some of ourselves so we can be a, a citizen of the kingdom. The world offers independence that leads to bondage, and a lot of us, that, that's, that's what we want is independence. Like, if I know enough, I don't need anybody else, but Christ offers slavery so that we may find freedom, and thanks be to God for that. And, and if that's what it takes to experience his fullness, that's what I desire. So you're ready to get into some nuts and bolts about this discipleship thing. So being rooted and grounded, we're going to hold each other up like the Redwoods. What that could look like in discipleship is us reaching up to someone that has what we desire. So that, that man, Ron Helley, back there. Ron, you're 75 now? 74? 76? How old are you now? So, so, so I was right the first time. Okay. All right. So Ron is a man. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm a pastor of the church. But you know what? Ron has been married to his wife for over 50 years. And I've been married to my wife for 27 years. And I watch him interact with her. And he's got a twin brother that looks a lot like him. And, and he's, he's married too. And the two of them interact together. It's like the cutest, awesome, most wonderful thing ever. And I desire that for myself. I desire that with my, and now I'm crazy about my wife. If she was here, y'all would like her so much better than me. I mean, <laughs> everybody does. Like they meet me and they're like, man, you're great. Well, here's my wife, Tamara. And they're like, oh, she's better. <laughs> like we really like Tamara. So I've asked, so you, you may not know this, but Ron and I meet all the time. We have a kind of a standing date where I can just sit there and talk to him about stuff because I need to be pulled up. He is further down the road than me in some things, and, and, and then I'm happy with that situation. Uh, and and there's, there's other men that have things that I desire too that like I will meet with from time to time. Tell me how you do that. Would you equip me in that area? Hey, man, I'm, I'm dealing with this, and this is kind of new, because I don't know about you folks, but I wake up every single day trying to figure this thing out. <laughs> like, I really, I wake up, I woke up this morning, like, okay, well, I got something I got to figure out. And uh, to have people like that that help me is amazing. So I'm getting pulled up, but then guess what? I have a group of 12 young guys that I'm trying to pull up to. their 20s and 30s. They're in my closed group that I meet with as their minister because I'm trying to equip them for ministry. In addition to that, I have my small group coaches that are older men that I'm trying to equip them for ministry. So I've got, of all the groups that I've got, there's a whole bunch of folks I'm trying to pull up. I can't do it if I don't have Ron Hilly. Rooted and established. 
ropes around me. Guess what? With that much accountability, along with studying scriptures and all that, it's very difficult for me to get myself in a bad situation. You know, traveling with people. Um, you know, Greg, man, he's one of my best pals. He's, he's heard the good, bad, and ugly with me. And you know what? I've heard it with him, too. Because we have kids that are about the same age, and we want to kill them most of the time. <laughs> hmm. True story. And you know what? I, I, could, I could have problems with my kids from time to time and deal with it on my own. Thanks be to God, I got that dude like, hey, man, I'm about to go choke that kid out. <laughs> hmm. All right. Let's not choke them out. Let's, let's try. And, and I have it. They're all still alive. I've even got a grandson. It's great. And they love me. They, they sent me messages this morning telling me how much they would love me this morning. So that's good. So rooted and established. Do we kind of get it? For us to be able to take this out into the world, we got to have it for ourselves. We can live every single day with the fullness of God. That's available to you, and that's how all of this is designed. So if you'll get out your uh, wheel, that, that handout. So what I want to do is just uh, go over some of that with you. And this is going to be interactive. And, you know, typically, typically how this would be done is I would break everybody up into five different groups and I would assign you each one of these and all those kind of things. And, and then we'd all come back together and then we would kind of listen to what everybody came up with with the, group, with the, the individual sections and all that. We're probably not going to have time for that, so we're going to do it kind of like we did yesterday. Um, so I, I just I want to talk first about the spiritually dead. Okay, uh, these are the people that don't know Jesus. This, this is, would be in the hard soil, uh, the path, the seed falls on the path kind of folks, right? And so this is where I need you to interact with me because this is where, where we're going to be able to understand that if we come across somebody, we can listen to what they say. We can identify their beliefs and know that what is the action that we need to take as disciple makers to help them, to give that seed a chance to grow. So regarding the spiritually dead, what, what do you think the beliefs of the spiritually dead might be? What, what are their attitudes and behaviors? What, what do you think that that might look like? Uh, I'll, I'll give you the first one just because it's easy. They don't believe in God. Disbelief, right? Does anybody else got another one? Yeah, Negative. Self-reliant, that's so good. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, so in the interest of time, that's all very good. Does anybody have another one? Like, what? what, what? Say that to me one more time. I'm just, I think. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they're. Not saying, oh, yes, okay, yeah, so, so maybe they, they're hostile to Christianity, okay? All right? Angry with God, very, very good. Yeah, they're hurting, they're hurting. They, yeah, they try to pull you down. I'm just writing all this down because it's good. My, my sheet's blank, too. Um, and, and, and I've done this before, so I kind of know the answers, but everything that y'all are identified, life's a spiritually dead person. And it's a good thing to do, go to a spiritually dead person when they say this, like, wait, so you believe in that whole sky dad thing? Are you kidding me? You really believe there's a God? What about all those shootings in Texas? Right? I, I'm kind of giving away the next thing. What are some phrases that they might say? What might you hear the spiritually dead say? We call it the phrase from the stage. Yep. If God is so good, why is there evil? Okay. But the Bible is a myth. Yeah, why give your money to the church? It's a bunch of rules. Yeah, what's he done for you lately? What's that? I believed in God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Very, very good. Faith is for the weak. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that. I've actually heard that one. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So th- th- there's an ignorance, right? Very, very good. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. So, uh, so yeah, w- so we got some phrases. It's, it's usually hot, you know. Oftentimes it's hostile. Like, do you actually believe that stuff? Or uh, yeah, faith is for the weak. Man, faith is just a crutch for you people that can't deal. I've heard that one too. So, so I mean, is that resonating with you guys? So let's look at the next question. Do you see how this is the nuts and bolts? Because they're out there, by the way. And I would venture to say that they're the ones that we avoid. Are, they, are we okay with them going to hell? I hope not. Jesus isn't. He died for them too. All right, so what do you think that they need from us? Do they need for us to get a megaphone and go, hey, you better love God or you're going to get torched? Is that the right approach? Okay. So let, let's, let's talk about that. What do you think that they need? What, what can we do for them? Yeah, we, so uh, if you see on the wheel, it says share. So we want to share. Our, we want to share our lives. Um, share the gospel. And, and so let, let me just offer this to you. Do you so in 1 Peter 3.15, Peter tells us that we should be prepared to give an answer for our faith. We should be prepared. So I'm going to offer you, we want nuts and bolts, I'm going to give you a nuts and bolts. This, there's not a scripture for this other than Peter says we need to do it. Do you have an elevator pitch for, to, to answer that question? If somebody asks you, you mean to tell me you believe in that skydive stuff? Yes, I do. Here's why. And then you have like a, like if you're in an elevator, it only takes about a minute to get where you're going. Do you have something that you could say to somebody, all I know is I was this, and now I'm this. And I can't explain it, but all I know is it's real, and I want everybody to know about it as much as possible. That's a testimony. You don't have to have any superior knowledge of the scripture to be able to tell. So here's my question. Are you able to tell others what Christ has done for your life? I want you to think about that. What has being a Christian actually done for you? And be ready to tell somebody about it. That's discipleship. That is a way that, because what, what if they don't believe that the Bible's real anyway, you're not going to go, okay, well, let's do the Romans road, shall we? Let's start in chapter one of, like, what? No. The, one of the first awesome things we could do is actually live out our faith, which, by the way, is the biggest barrier to all this anyway, because somebody said it. They have witnessed Christians being a bad example. First thing that we do is we, we share with them our habits. And, and that doesn't necessarily require words. We just do it. The sec- second thing that we can do is we can be prepared to share our testimony Because testimony, you know, stories work really well with people. They can resonate with stories before they get into the, all the chapter and verse and all those other kind of things. So I just want to offer this. So does everybody kind of get, so what does the dead need? They need for us to share, like our testimony, they need us to share our habits. Um, share the gospel. It's on the wheel. So what's my part and what's God's part and what's their part? Let's start with my part. So what's my part? It's, it's, it's actually an easy question. It's like, I'm not trying to trip you up. So what's my part? What, is, what do I do? Am I on the hook for the outcome? Nope. So if I have my elevator pitch ready, hey, all I know is I was this, and my life in Christ did this, and now I'm this, and it's real, and it's true, and I want it for you. 
I've done my part. Now, their part is to choose to hear it or not, to accept it or reject it. Their part is to ask us for more, right? Uh, Paul even talks about this. I, I planted, Paul is watered. Lord, I, we, our part, we can also pray that somebody comes behind you if they reject us. You, you see what I'm saying? Like we have a part in this deal, but we are not on the hook of the, for the outcome. Their part is to accept it or reject it. What's God's part? What's that? Convict them. That's it. Yeah. And here's the beautiful thing about all that. Um, God is still in the convicting business. He still is. And, you know, my, my belief, because I've seen it, is I haven't really met anybody he hasn't tried to pursue. All over the world. It's kind of funny when you when you drill down, like we can identify times in people's lives when God was actually after them. Um, and so I, I'm saying all that to encourage us. We are not on the hook for their salvation. That's God's part. I don't ever want anybody as a disciple maker to think that they are the ones who saved that person because you are not. Yep. So we're all on the same page about that, right? So that's all really good. That's God's part. Let's look a little bit about um, spiritual child because there's not a whole lot of difference. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, spiritual infant. There's not a whole lot of difference between the two. The only difference is, is um, so let's say you have a spiritual dead person and you share with them your elevator pitch and they go, okay, I want some of that in my life. And so uh, I, I, I want Jesus to be my Lord. And, and I'm willing to submit. Do they still know anything? And let me ask you this. Is it a requirement for them to know anything to come to Christ? I'm going to steal my own thunder again tonight. Tonight I'm going to give the Great Commission, and I'm going to do the therefore go part. Isn't it interesting, the preeminence of, of the order of things that Jesus tells them to do? So there's, the, the, there's only, only one imperative, make disciples. And then there's three participle phrases as you are going, baptizing, teaching. In the restoration movement, it has been my observation that we have kind of flipped that order around. That it's kind of we, we teach, we baptize, and then we go. <laughs> mm. I, I mean, I... <laughs> I'm glad y'all thought that was funny. I was kind of worried about it when I was going to say it. <laughs> so, good. Um, but would y'all agree? So, so the deal is, is um, if, if we have a spiritual dead person, and even if they are shacked up with the, you know, they don't know anything about repentance, but what they do know is that they want this. Jesus and them will work that out. We just, we just share with them, and we'll share with them on the other side of it, okay? Does that make sense? All right, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, so what's the beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors of an infant? Let's say that they've come to Christ, they have accepted the, they, they, they're they about the gospel, do they, do they know anything yet? No. So, um, so what are some beliefs about them? What, what might they believe? Yeah, so we can have a baptized Christian that still thinks that all paths lead to God, right? Because they're ignorant about that, right? So all paths lead to God. Okay. What are some other beliefs of a new Christian? Yeah, uh, well, I've done all I need to do. Um, I'm saved. I'm good. Okay, so let's, I'm going to write that. That's good. Yeah, uh, so yeah, so um, there's there's they're still ignorant, right? And can that ignorance be frustrating? Can it be frustrating for a baby Christian to be in the presence of people that are incredibly smarter than them and they don't know what the heck anybody's saying and they don't have anybody sharing with them, right? Are y'all y'all understand what I'm saying? Like they're they're new and somebody's talking about the mysteries of the angels and. And they're like, well, I don't know. I mean, and, and they don't have anybody helping them. 
you, you can see like the lack of root create, creates a problem. And how, how many times have you seen this in our walk where we have a baby Christian and they haven't figured it all out yet and they may not have been repentant because they don't necessarily know what they're doing is wrong and then we're having a conversation and somebody says something really ugly about their sin and that person doesn't even know that they have that sin and they feel judged and then they're like, well, to heck with this, right? So we have a responsibility with the spiritual infants, don't we? Like, you're not going to take a baby and ask him to go mow the lawn, are you? I mean, that would, that would just not be, that, w- that would not be good for the baby. It wouldn't be good for the lawn either. <laughs> so what are some phrases that an infant might say? Because remember, they're still very selfish, okay? Uh, if you look at the language and behaviors, it's ignorance. Um, I, I'll give you one. Here, here's something an infant might say because they're, they're, uh, they might say something like, um, yeah, I didn't really like that song we sang today. We just, like I was at church, but I didn't like the, I don't, I don't like the music. Right? Like, like what, what's happening up there is for them. Do, do you see the... Yeah, I didn't really like that. What, what's something else an infant might say? Do I have to give Yeah, do I, do I have to? Do I have to give or do I have to Yeah, why do I have to give, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so what do I get out of this, right? It's, it's, an, infant, it's an infant type stage. Do, do you guys hear this stuff from time to time? Let, let, let me blow your mind now. Are there people that have been in Christianity for 50 years that are still in this stage? Yeah. That, yes. All right, we're done here, God. No. <laughs> and so here's what I need to say about the wheel. Um, I gave examples of each quadrant kind of how that shows up. Uh, so it is biblical, but this is not the, this is a tool. This is never anything that should be used as a weapon. This is something that should be used to help you as a disciple maker, where if you come across somebody and you hear a certain phrase, you go, okay, in their spiritual development, they're here, so therefore I should share. I should share my habits, I should share my testimony, I should share the gospel. Does that make, like, I'm trying to make this easy for you. I hear this, so what they need is this. Okay, it's not ever to be weaponized. You don't. You should never go into a conversation. I should never go, Tom. Hey, spiritual infant, right there. Because I'm going to tell you, I, I like to think I'm a spiritual uh, parent, and, and I have produced fruit. I have, but you know what? Sometimes I catch myself saying things that are very childish, and I go, Ooh, yeah, I, I probably need to. I'm just being honest. like it happens. So like. Just because you're somewhere doesn't mean you stay there, right? And just, <laughs> but this is a tool, tool only, because we're talking about advancing God's kingdom, things that we see, biblical examples of in the Bible, and what the apostles did in order to reach that person. So we share. Um, so what does an infant need? It needs attention. Like, okay, so attention. It needs food. It needs milk. So... Huh? Clean them up. Yes. To, and this kind of goes with the whole sharing of habits. Like, hey, um, so I notice that you're still shacked up with your girlfriend. Um, I, I want to teach you something called healthy shaming. All right? I, I know shame's got like a bad wor- word now, but there's actually a healthy version of it. And it goes like this. Um, hey, uh, I notice that you've got this sin. Um, and I just want you to know that I love you, and the relationship is not at risk. But you are submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ now. And we don't do that. And I'm willing to help you however I possibly can uh, to move out of that situation. But if, if Christ is your Lord, we cannot continue down this path. Here's why, biblically. That's sharing. That's, that's milk. The relationship is not at risk, but you got to stop. 
grace and truth in one sentence, Jesus modeled it with the adulteress. Neither do I condemn you, but you got to stop. You got to leave your life of sin. Grace and truth. Okay? And that's, that's a healthy shame. We don't do that. That's not like us. What you are doing is not what we do. So an infant needs, uh, so it needs accountability, also needs protection. We need to protect our infants um, from the wolves, okay? We need to protect them. So once again, what's my part? Yep, we still share. We still share our habits. We share the gospel with them. We remind them of things. Um, we, We share biblical truth with them. Okay, it's not a whole lot different than the dead because they really honestly know about as much. I've met spiritual, spiritually dead people in prison that know everything about the Bible, right? So my part is to share what's God's part here. Yeah, continue to convict, continue to, continue to, to grow them, right? To continue to put the right people in their path. And what's their part? What's that? I, I just can't hear. I, grow. Continue to grow. Uh, to seek out those relationships. Right? To continue to show up. Okay? All right. So let's move to children. So the language and behaviors characterized by children is, is still self-centeredness. Okay? They understand the gospel. They show up to church. Um, and so what do you think the beliefs and attitudes of a child are? I'll give you one. So typically in the spiritual children phase, this is the roots, right? So the roots aren't that deep. One of the beliefs or one of the behaviors I see is they get disillusioned because they're actually around Christians and they're starting to notice that they're not all perfect. Okay, so that's, that's like one of the things that I know. So when we talk about not having roots, um, like that's one of the things that will make them go to heck with this, right? So, um, so disillusionment. Uh, this would be kind of what I was talking about. Yeah, you know, I keep showing up, and they keep singing that one song. I hate it. I mean, I, I believe the gospel. I believe in Jesus and all, but man, whew. Uh, this, this, you know, you know, preacher, that uh, that sermon didn't really work for me. That one didn't land. Next next week, try better. Hey, can we talk about end times? <laughs> Like, hey, I appreciate all this discipleship stuff, but none of that, like, can we just talk about end times, right? That's, that's spiritual child. Um, any other beliefs you can think of regarding that? It's still about them, self-centeredness, right? Okay. At the same time, there could be some good things. Uh, they could be really excited, okay, uh, excited about learning new things. Um, and so uh, another belief or, or attitude or behavior we may see is that a spiritual child may want to be like, dude, can I preach next Sunday? <laughs> right? I've got a word. I would like, could, could I just have a sermon next Sunday? Could you just give me one sermon? Like, that, that's something a, a spiritual child might say. Okay, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Are they necessarily ready or trained or equipped for that? Not, not necessarily, right? We, we would have to help them. So what are some phrases a child might say? What's that? Yeah, I'm not being fed here. That's right. Um, I love my small group, but there's others who need a group like this. Or, I'm sorry, that's not, that's not it. I love my small group, but... Don't add any more people to it. I love my small group the way it is. Don't, I, I don't want any more people. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, like, so, so why do we, why do we do whatever? Why, why do we keep doing that? Why, um, 
Yeah, so we might hear something like that. And you hear that when you get those questions, like, I'm going to tell you, sometimes in ministry we don't like questions, do we? Like, because I said so. No. <laughs> that, that's not what they need, right? They don't need that. What might you be doing for the kingdom of God when they ask that question, you pull them aside and go, come here. All right, here's what this is all about. <laughs> here, son, everywhere that the light touches. No, whatever. <laughs> Um, it would be beneficial to the, for the kingdom. So, so in this particular case, what we do, what does a child need? A child needs connection. They, they might be able to feed themselves some, but they still need things from others. Like a, a six-year-old shouldn't drive. Somebody should drive them. Do, you, do y'all get that analogy? Somebody should still, like, hey, get in the back and let's do this thing. Uh, So they need to be connected to purpose. Like, okay, you know this. um, What do you think God's purpose for you is? And and that you have a purpose and all those kind of, because they may not know that they have that. Connect them to a small group, a family. Like, they need accountability. They need people. That was one of the things that we talked about. And we need to continue to connect them to God. Okay, so they need connection, and I'm just moving this along because I only got 10 minutes, and we still got three, two more quadrants. So my part in that is, uh, as we said, connect. What's God's part? Continue to convict, send them the right people, uh, continue to grow them, uh, to, sh- uh, to help them with their purpose, to help them identify their purpose. And their, what's their part? To respond, right? To, to actually engage with others, okay? And so, uh, are y'all still with me? Are we still good? Ten more minutes, okay. So, like, like I said, this is a tool. If we come across somebody that says, I really like my small group. I don't want to add anybody else. That is a great teaching, wonderful opportunity. Listen. This is a reproducible process. We're going to branch this thing. So we need more people to come in so we can branch so that more disciples are made. Right? And help them understand. Oh. Right? So let's talk about uh, the young adult. Now, by the way, the the biggest difference between a spiritual child and a young adult, this is the biggest jump in the discipleship process, is to get them from thinking about themselves to actually start thinking about others. That's when you know, when you come across somebody in the discipleship process, that they have moved into young adulthood when they actually start thinking about other people. So when they get here, this is when we want to train them to minister, to train them to serve others. And so uh, here's some things, um, so some beliefs, attitudes about them. I'll give you a few. Uh, They desire to serve others for the good. So like... Like the child that says, like, hey, I want a sermon. Instead of saying, I want to preach to everybody, they might say something like this. You know, I think I'm ready to lead a small group on my own. I I would like to be trained as a small group leader so that I could have my own tribe. Do you all see that? And and so, and for the sake of time, I'm kind of doing this for you. That's something that they would say, and we would need to train them and equip them so that they could do that. Another phrase from the stage that they might say, that that this is like the telltale one, is when somebody will come up to me and go, hey, I noticed that Johnny wasn't here. Like, do do you see that level of maturity? They're not talking about the songs that we sang Sunday. They're talking about, you know, they don't really, they do care about what the songs they sing, but they, they notice that somebody else wasn't there. You start going, okay, they are here in their journey, and here I need to start putting them in charge. And I need to equip them and train them to be in charge of things. And so uh, what a young adult would need is equipping, training, education, um, encouragement. That's what they need from us. And so my part would be to equip. What's God's part? It doesn't change a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, to help help them continue to grow, uh, to uh, empower them, 
uh, to fill them with his fullness. And their part is kind of to, to receive the equipping and take the risk. Because like I said, this is, this is the part where it gets scary when you start doing things for others. Right? Uh, it, it's not usually the young adult um, that does the hurting. It's, they're the ones that get hurt by the others. When, when they start moving into service and then it's like, wait, you don't like me? You don't like the way I said that? You don't. So we have, to, we have to prepare them for that. We have to train them for that. And the last one is the spiritual parent. And so you may not think um, there's a whole lot of uh, difference between the two, but there actually is. Um, what a spiritual parent is able to do is that they have the ability to think in terms of an entire team. Okay? Um, and they have a coaching mindset. Like, so they're at the point that they're like, may maybe they took on a small group, they've shepherded that group, They've grown the group to the point that it needs to branch. So this is what a spiritual parent would do. I need a new leader for the group that branches. So I would like for you to come with me. Do, do you see the reproducible process starting to happen with them? And they're starting to be the one that actually branches and moves this thing along? Uh, that's how they're thinking now. Like they're wanting to parent somebody else. And so things that they may say... Um, I've got a few here. Uh, this guy at work asked me to explain the Bible to him. Pray for me. That's a spiritual parent. Like, hey, man, I've got a really difficult case at work. Spiritually dead person, really hostile towards God. I'm going to share the gospel with him tonight. Would you please pray for me, everyone? That's, a, that's something you might hear a spiritual parent say. Uh, another thing, you know, uh, we get to baptize someone from our small group tonight. When is the next 101 class? I want to get them plugged into ministry somewhere. Like, <laughs> so th there, there's an example of b baptism and getting them connected, like getting them from infancy to spiritual child as quickly as possible. Okay? That's what a spiritual parent would do. And so uh, for them, we need to release them to be a disciple maker. Now, does this necessarily mean that they have a strategy and they're able to do all of that? Not yet. And so we stay with them. And we offer support. And so uh, our part is to pray for them and to counsel them. Offer support when needed. And then the other part is, is we have to release them. And for many of us, that's the hardest part. Like, Remember last night when I talked about, like, is, is discipleship so important? Or it was yesterday. Discipleship is so important, it's worth letting somebody mess it up, right? It really is. So we release them, and then we kind of watch them, and they, ooh, you know, that, all right, come here. Let, let's try this. But y'all understand that Jesus did that with his disciples when they couldn't cast out the demon. Like, all right, boys, you got to pray and fast for that, right? That's what releasing looks like and allowing them to fail. And for whatever reason in church, we don't want to ever fail, but it's actually failing forward. So that's what a parent needs. My part in that is, is, is um, to release them. My part in that is to offer support. Their part is to take the risk. Their part is to be the spiritual parent and shepherd. God's part is what God's part always is, okay? Is there any questions about that? Like, does this actually help you a little bit? And, and so I just want to take, it, that. by the way, that was the so abbreviated version of that. And I know some of you have heard some of this before. But this is, when we talk about uh, that pyramid up there, how do we train our people for ministry, this is one of the tools that we use. So our people, when they join our church, guess what? They go to 101, we talk to them about the church, here's what we believe, here's how we operate. We don't even call our people members. This is kind of cool. We call them partners. Uh, that's why we call our church Real Life Ministries. If you were to categorize what kind of church we are, we're an independent Christian church like, like you guys. Um, but we call ourselves Real Life Ministries because Everybody in there is a minister. 
And so uh, when they come on board, we, we present 101 to them. This is what we believe. This is what we do. We don't call them members. We call them partners because we're all partnering with each other. Okay? It's the job of the ministerial staff to equip them for ministry. And so the very next thing, so that's 101. Then we send them to 201. And guess what they learn in 201? This. All right, so you are our partner. Now, let's, let's talk about what we're going to ask you to do. We're going to ask you to be disciplers. And then we, we actually ask them, all right, look at this wheel. Where do you think you are? Because that helps us too, right? So I, I hope I made sense with all this. I mean, I, I hope I didn't, like, I hope this was some nut and bolt, nuts and bolts. Because anytime that we present the whole discipleship in church thing, like, everybody's like, yeah, we should do that. And then they go, well, how do we do it? And then usually, like, I don't ever want to be the one that doesn't give you something. So did I give you something that you can at least start with? Okay. And so I would just offer this in closing. I would have, if you don't have an elevator pitch that you could share with a spiritually dead person, I would, I would just tell you to come up with one. And, and it, it could be as simple as this. What has Jesus done for you? How has being a Christian changed your life? Because I, I can tell you that there are some hopeless people. And so if you were to tell a story like, you know what? Um, I was hopeless. I had a sin condition that I could do nothing about. And I realized that my sin was sending me on a trajectory that the outcome was nothing but horrible. Not only for this life, but for eternity. And no matter how much good I tried to do, or how, you know, I kept falling short. But I know, but I learned that Jesus Christ, he's not the proverbial jerk in the sky that people make him out to be. In fact, he loved us so much, like God himself loved us so much, knowing that we couldn't take care of our situation, decided to take the punishment for us, so that we could be reconciled to him. So he, he doesn't hate us. And every time I see a sunset, I'm reminded, I go, whoever made all that doesn't hate us. He loves us. And you know what? When I, when I open my eyes to that, I experience that, and I notice that my, my heart fills up like a tank, and that it outflows, and then I don't have hostility towards people, and I like, just meet them, and I love them, and I tell them I love them. And I didn't used to do that before, but I do it all the time now, even in Canada. <laughs> and, and all I know is, is I was sick and dead in my sin, but now I'm alive in Christ, and like I read headlines, and I don't care what they say because if I don't care about it in heaven I don't care about it now uh, but I do care about you and I know that Jesus does too that's what that's what I got would you like to know more <laughs> like that's an elevator that's one of my elevator pitches I didn't quote any scripture I didn't have to have all the answers all I had to say is what it did for me so I'm just offering you guys that every single one of you is a disciple maker. You're called to be one, and you already have all that it takes to do it. All right? You either just have to share with them. If, they're, if they already know the gospel and have accepted it, you've got to connect them with others. So it is your responsibility to help them get connected with the right people so that they can be rooted and established, so they can experience the fullness of God because we don't do it alone. If, if they've made the, the leap to where they actually start caring about other people, then what we need to do is we need to start getting them in ministry where they're serving others. If they're starting to think about people, they need to, we need to equip them so they can do that. And then the last thing we need to do is release them. After we've equipped them, say, all right, Bucko, you got this. I'm here for you. Now go do what we just did, all right? Does that make sense, ladies and gentlemen? All right, it's lunchtime. Yes, sir. Um, Michael Hendricks, and he spells it weird, M-I-C-H-E-L. Michael Hendricks. Thank, thank you for that. A great guy. Unbelievable. Like one of the best humans I've ever met. And when I was reading that book, our, our church was reading it. And, and I was reading it, I was like, man, I had a conversation with a guy that said the exact same thing. I wonder how this guy knows. Oh. And then I'm like, dude, Michael, I just bought your book. So, true story. Anybody else? All right, let's pray. Holy God, 
Uh, just thank you for this time together. Thank you for this time that we could get together. And, and Father, uh, I just gave an incredibly abbreviated version of something that's kind of big. And I just pray that some of it could take root and there was some understanding there. And, and uh, where there is no understanding, um, Father, just uh, I just ask that you uh, bring someone, somebody behind me to help them understand. But Father, we know uh, that we love you. We know that we will desire for your kingdom to advance. And we know that in your part, you will convict us, you will grow us, and you will give us everything that we need with the help of your mighty Holy Spirit to help us be advancers of your kingdom. Because that's what you called us to do, and you said that all authority has been given to you and that you are with us till the end of the age. And so we pray expectantly about that, and Father, we pray expectantly for everything that you're going to do in this province and in Canada and in North America and what you're continuing to do in the world. And we thank you for Jesus who showed us how. It's in his name we pray. Amen.